Wow, this is uh, this is great. We're so excited, you know, to be here and you know, seeing such a big crowd. I mean, like this is. If you remember, like you know, three years ago, we were just like a bunch of us, you know, like in our office, and now I mean, like seeing so much interest. I think it's it's impressive. So very excited to be here, everybody. So my name is Javier de la Torre. I'm the I'm the founder of uh, of Carto. Obviously, love geospatial, been on this industry for a long time. I'm very much, you know, like into particularly like a space of modeling. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Um, but you know, like more than anything, I think you know, like starting, you know, as as this conference, I thought, you know, like it would be great to discuss about how our our car like industry is growing really fast. I and mean, like uh, Flo uh, saw some of the numbers, but it's impressive to see the amount of like private. <laughs> great. <laughs> it's impressive, right? Uh, there you go, dongles. Okay, so it's impressive to see now the amount of people coming from the private sector on top of the public and you know, on the academia. There's a, there's a huge increase in interest of organizations as they are realizing of the power of applying spatial analytics to their business problems. And that's very exciting because for someone like me who's you know, been on this space, they're like, this is amazing. You should all be doing the spatial analytics. It finally feels like people are catching up and it's very exciting on that. So <clears throat> why is the case? Very often I have to explain to, uh, uh, to organizations, to users, why you know, spatial analytics and spatial data science matters. And very often it starts by you know, explaining them the difference between knowing where and knowing why. And this is a, a very kind of like concise kind of like method to kind of like explain them. It's easy, or right now it's, you know, it's accessible to many users understanding you know, like where their particular customers, for example, are. Making a map to see where something happens is one thing, and it's accessible, and it's actually being democratized in a lot of sense by BI vendors like Tableau, right? But it's very different if what you're looking for is to understand why they're happening there. And this is key. Okay, we're gonna have fun with it on go all day. All right. So, uh, but this is key, you know, like if you really want to call, like, then take decisions out of the data, right? So if you really, uh, you know, want to call, like, you know, change your, um, your marketing strategy, you want to understand really, you know, like, do a different segments, for that you actually need to run a spatial model. And for that, our bet in there is that you do need to do a spatial analytics for, you know, an LI platform. But that distinction between, you know, like, understanding where and why, why I find it very useful to, to explain to, to the audiences you know, like why a space of matters. Now, one issue that we have is that there's a big shortage. There's 600 of us here, um, but you know, like that's in a way doesn't cover at all. You know, like the requirements. I mean, the demand of a spatial analytics that right now exists in the world. Um, in fact, we probably all heard that you know, like there's a very big shortage of data scientists. But when you talk about like a spatial data scientist, there's not many. <laughs> Out there, so really, we say like it's probably one percent or even less. This is total guess, you know, like of data scientists that understand geo. I mean, that's probably fair to say, and that's definitely not going to make it. So, so there's a there's an issue in there, right? We, there's not enough data scientists that understand geo and therefore can leverage it on their analysis, and this is one of the things you know I want to ask here the audience. I mean, like this conference in particular. One of its goals is to get more data scientists understanding the power of a spatial data science. And that's what we want to bring people who are actually doing analysis to showcase to others so they, they learn, they get interested, you know, they get into the field, right? So this is very important. We have to run events, education, and all of you are also responsible for promoting, you know, like what is, you know, like why a spatial is so important, or why a spatial is a special, or what, you know, a spatial is something that you should consider, right? So that's one part. The other, which I'm going to be you know, going a little bit more deep, is that we do actually have to make a spatial data science something more productive, accessible, and automated. It is unfortunate, you know, like some of, the, uh, of our work on a daily basis, it still it can be quite um, kind of like, um, slow, and it can be actually quite frustrating, to be honest. So where do we actually spend most of our time? Um, we've heard a lot, you know, like, People talk about like, yeah, we spend 80% of our time just cleaning up data. Right? Seems very random. But the reality, it is actually there. And we see that at Carto when working with customers over and over again. You know, like just finding what is the data that you can use for you know, your analysis takes enormous amounts of time. Googling around, you know, like, and then that's only the first. 
then you have to go and talk to the providers. If they happen to you know, be selling the data, you're probably gonna have to end up even sending a fax. I mean, that's the state in some cases of you know, like how it is finding data uh, on our space. And then finally, then you have to put it into your system. Probably you have to change the support, uh, the geographic support, you have to do transformations, put it you know, like into a common format, so that finally you can start doing analysis. Right? And that whole part, I'm sure like all of you agree with me, is not fun. It's really not fun, and it's actually kind of reducing our productivity as, a, as an industry. Right? It's so much, you know, like before I go in there, that this problem is producing that a lot of organizations do not touch location data because of the cost of going through all of this. So let me put you an example of a, of a data scientist that you know, like we, we work with. So she needed, actually, she was doing a typical market analysis in Portugal, you know, for planes, solar panels, doesn't matter. But the thing is, like, she needed something very obvious. She needed zip code data and she needed demographics. Well, I mean, the cost of that data is not that high from a commercial provider, I'm talking. Um, and it's in the order of like $2,000. But, you know, the time to get access to these data sets, I mean, you can sum up, you know, to, we put it, you know, like an estimate cost of 8000 but it was on the order of like two to three weeks of, you know, sending emails, finding who could provide it and all this. Can you imagine all the time spent just so that you could do like very, you know, just get started with your analysis? This is frustrating and it also showcases that our industry is broken when it comes to data access. And this industry where, you know, like location is about putting everything on the context of, you know, other data, you know, having so much problems getting access to data, I think is the number one problem we have to solve. Uh, but that's just one part. There's a lot more things that you then have to call, like, uh, have to do on your day to day, right? You have to work around geocoding, creating isochrones, finding spatial lags, the discovery and data access that I was talking, changing your geographic support. All these things are steps normally in most of the spatial analysis that you know like you will do on a day to day, day by day, right? So um, this is one of the things you know like we actually look at Carto and look at how can we simplify that, how we can increase increase the productivity. And I'm going to be showing you a demo later, but um, essentially we do it through two products that some of you might be aware of. So Carto Frames is our Python package for spatial data science workflows. So um, it enables you to visualize data, to do certain analysis, to kind of like do data ingestions. And then Data Observatory 2.0, which we announced actually last week, um, is our repository of prepared data from many sources so that you can find it easier and then you can start using it straight away, right? From data enrichment to kind of like a unified grid and things like that, right? This is our goal to make you know, like a spatial data science more productive. It is all based on what we call, you know, like a next generation of spatial data infrastructure. So a lot of this is, you know, just getting data from providers, you know, like doing all DTL, preparing it, registering another registry with the metadata. So finally, you know, you can actually make it available in the simple tools that you will see there. We actually decided to call it build all this on top of the Google Cloud. And in particular, based on one single project called BigQuery, uh, which is, how, like right now, from our point of view, really redefining really you know what is uh, what is the, the the best infrastructure you know for for hosting geospatial data. It's very exciting in that. In fact, you know, like one of the things that we were working with Google that we decided was collaborating with them with a project around public geospatial data, where they are hosting a lot of like public data sets and you know making it straight away available on BigQuery. And you know we're going to be collaborating with them on you know like making public uh, geospatial data available for free for anybody. And for that, actually, we'd like to welcome to stage uh, um, Chad Jennings from, uh, from uh, the, the product manager for BigQuery GIS. Thank you, Jennings. <laughs> Chad. Good morning. <clears throat> so just for a few questions. So Chad, thank you very much for joining us oh, today. It's my pleasure. It's great to be here with you all. For us, it's been you know, like a very great journey working now with, uh, with Google Cloud you know, on, on, on you know, creation of data observatory. And one, we've been very impressed you know, like by the geospatial capabilities that you've introduced on BigQuery. Can you tell us about you know, like why is you know, that investment and you know, how is it going? Sure. Um, so uh, BigQuery is Google Cloud's enterprise data warehouse, and not all, um, you know, not all SQL engines and not all data warehouses support GIS. And we wanted to make BigQuery as useful to as many different kinds of people and different kinds of analysis and different kinds of jobs as we could. So we have things like embedded machine learning and 
um, through you know, a, a small but dedicated team, we introduced GIS into the platform as well so that we could you know, help folks like you solve the problems that you're working on. That's great. Um, we've been using, uh, the query has a lot of like uh, extensibility, so we've been creating like custom geospatial functions using H3 cells and you know like many, many things. Uh, we've enjoyed a lot of the scalability of the, of the platform. But one thing that you know like obviously we like a lot was this public data uh, Kali program. We think you know like that's, that's a game changer in terms of accessibility. So um, can you tell us a little bit about you know like the program and you know like. Sure, sure. So um, in, in fields other than GIS, or in, in, other than geo as well as geo, um, there are, you know, they're just data sets that you need to get your job done, whether it's uh, census data or whether the zip code polygon is, like whatever. And so we, uh, we started publishing data sets and hosting them inside of BigQuery, where BigQuery pays the storage and users can just use them. You know, it's as easy as just writing the table name in your query. You don't have to copy data, you don't have to move it. Um, and we did some research after the program had been live for a couple years and realized that the most often uh, joined data with their own data set, so like we have a public data set and you know, the customer's own data, the most often joined data sets were really kind of boring ones, right? Like, like administrative boundaries. Um, they were just like, you know, they were you know, geo-registration tables and things like that. So A, we realized there was demand for geo, and B, we realized that it wasn't like you know, it, it wasn't you know, lofty or highfalutin data sets that were getting used a lot. It was the stuff that people just needed to do their work. So we doubled down on producing stuff like that. So, and that's, I think, what's born the collaboration that we have. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, like, this is uh, just, well, we are announcing today uh, this collaboration with Google. One of the key things, one of the first data sets that we're working is probably relevant to a lot of people here is the American Community Survey, so the census data right for on. U.S. is all available, the whole historical data set with the boundaries and so on, which I think it's, it's great. I call it, you know, the batteries included of geospatial, of spatial analytics, right? Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's nothing worse than getting a Christmas present and then having to go out and buy batteries for yeah, it. Like that's it's a all good there. point, so, so I love that. So, great, I think, you know, like we would love, you know, to probably show this in a demo. All right, well, I'll get out of the way and let you all see what the, the work that Javi and team have done. All right, thanks Thank for having me. Thank you. All right, great. Um, well, if you haven't, you know, like, tried, you know, the platform, I mean, we're going to be publishing blog posts about, you know, like, this uh, initiative uh, with Google next, and I really invite you to call like, and look at, you know, what the, um, but, you know, like the geospatial color capabilities, they're pretty amazing. Well, now, for Carla like, giving you a demo, we actually thought about using some real data, but it's uh, obviously, as you probably know, it's always very tough to kind of go and showcase revenue of a company here in a public audience like this. So we actually went and simulate uh, one particular use case, which is figuring out where should we open a new Starbucks in Long Island. So first disclosure, you should not open a Starbucks in Long Island. There's way too many. <laughs> if I actually find out when we did the analysis that you're never farther than 10 minutes away by car from a Starbucks, whatever you are in Long Island. So it's incredible saturation in there. Well, not an expert, you know, like on, on opening cafeterias, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, that's, uh, there's a lot of them. So what we actually look at is, like, what it will be, you know, like, if, we, if you were to move one Starbucks from one location to another, what it will actually be the potential revenue that that Starbucks could make in this new location, right? So that's actually a classical kind of size selection analytics, uh, analytics problems. Right? So just want to kind of show you a little bit, you know, how we actually will enable a use case like this. So I'm just going to open Google Call App. It's a Python notebooks uh, uh, um, interface, as you can see here. I'm just uh, first kind of going, you know, through the import of some of the libraries. So Carto, uh, Carto Frames is a Python notebooks library. It's based on GeoPandas, which is, you know, it's based on Pandas, which is essentially kind of like the, the uh, geospatial kind of like data format of, you know, Python notebooks. Um, so I'm just authenticating in there and so on. Um, one of the first things that you know like we, I'm going to be doing is just first loading the data. And the data, if you look at it, it is, uh, it is a CSV file, and all I have is just addresses. So very classical, you know, you're going to need to do geocoding. So we have, you know, like things like a geocoder built in on Carter frames that caches the data so that you don't pay twice for the same geocoding data. It's never happened to me. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm just geocoding, in this case, the, uh, uh, the, the stores, right? So that's the first thing. Then I get latitudes and longitudes, and then I can go and represent it on a map. So again, another functionality of Carter Frames, allowing you to visualize, you know, like data uh, very easily in Python notebooks and interactive vector maps that can, you know, like configure like that. So you see, just essentially call like geocode, 
uh, function and then just straight away into a map. And uh, next thing that uh, you will normally do in something like this is creating a spatial lag using SQL. So the biggest kind of like importance for like figuring out where to open Starbucks is how far you are from other Starbucks. So to the point like if you open a Starbucks, you know, like right close to the other Starbucks, the revenue that you will make will split in half between the two, potentially, right? That makes sense. So we create, you know, what we call a spatial lag, and we're gonna be just using SQL. By, um, by using our post GIS engine behind it, since so we're calculating what is the distance to the closest uh, Starbucks to every Starbucks, right? So um, it's an ST distance. We could be doing this also in Python, but just want to show you a little bit more of like how do you do this in, um, in, in car to tube. Um, so that's great. I get, you know, like that data. The next thing normally you will do in this case is go to what we call, you know, like defining the catchment area. And what is the catchment area in this concept? It's like, who, who are the customers that will come to visit my cafeteria, you know, like, um, you know, that are around them, you know, by car or by walking? So for that, we create what we call an isochrome uh, or an isoline. So, so it says, like, can you give me the polygon that will entitle all the possible locations that, you know, of coming to my store within less than, in this case, three minutes? And what you get back is this type of map, right? So you see? So this is, the, this is the Starbucks, and this is called like the area around it. So we call that the catchment area that you got in there, right? So you can see why, if I said like, if I put 10 minutes, you know, like around 85% of the entire Long Island will be covered by, by, by Starbucks. So I define now that catchment area. And that's gonna be useful a lot for later for my model to essentially train it and get more data with it. Um, what am I doing later on, on, on this? So now I have, you know, like the data prepared. The next thing normally I will go is to go and discover data. So we talk about like what data can I use to make a model to predict this. So for that here, I just want to show you a little bit of you know, like the integration with Data Observatory. So Data Observatory is a catalog on the cloud, and when you run it, you know, from car to frames, we have a lot of like functionality to essentially kind of like explore the catalog in here. So I'm not going to write in line; I'm just going to be uncommenting things. But you know, like you look first of all, where do we have data? In, so you can see already and get a list of objects, you know, like of countries. Um, what categories of data do I have in the United States? Roads, you know, points of interest, financial, etc. How is, you know, like what is the geographies? In what geographic kind of like support system formats do I have data available for demographics in the United States? So things like block groups, you know, like census tracts, you know, like you have the data available on all these formats. And one in particular in here, what data sets are available by block group in the United States for demographics? So this is what I'm gonna be using in here. So I'm using actually a commercial provider, it's called AGS, not ACS. And you're know, giving me data sets around like business counts, consumer profiles, you know, consumer perspective, retail potential, social demographic, right? So this is a classical kind of like how you will access uh, commercial data. Um, now, another way of finding data is what we call like uh, looking by the area of interest. Um, so if you look at my, at the, at the area that I'm studying, Long Island, I can have it here defined as a polygon. Um, I can say like, give me data that is available for that particular polygon. So you can just, you know, like pass that data frame, this your uh, data frame, and it will filter the catalog based on that. So I think that's pretty cool too. Um, okay, so after I've done that, um, next thing that I'm gonna be doing, oh, working with the data set, is now that I have a data set that I've uh, um, got defined, I can actually get metadata about it. So for example, things like, um, oh, what did I put, the data set, click here, there it is. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm just getting, you know, like what are the, what are the, uh, yeah, here it is. Sorry, so this is, uh, this is metadata about this particular data set that I was working, things like, you know, what is the, what is the name, sorry, this is very long. Um, the description, the name, you know, and I also get things like, uh, you know, like uh, the describe methods. So if you're familiar with, uh, with data frames, a very popular kind of like method is to say like, can you tell me about this data set? And that's even before I get access to it, even if I buy it, right? So I can get, you know, like the typical kind of like maximums per column, pretty cool. Um, I can explore obviously the variables, what is, you know, like what are the columns inside data sets? So things like, you know, like population, you know, like household income, et cetera. So I have it all in here in this data set. I can, you know, like look at one particular variable. I can look what is the metadata that I have available for it. So things like, you know, like the 
the description, you know, like the typical aggregation method that you could use with it, you know, like things like that that you will be useful, and also I can describe it. So I can look at, you know, like what is the average, the max, minimum of this value for this data set. Very useful when evaluating um, uh, a data set for your, for your analysis. Now, this is the part that I'm most excited about, because, you know, like we introduced this concept of instance subscription to data sets. So imagine that this data set, if I actually look at, uh, if I look at it and I'm interested, I think can help me to get, uh, to, to do my analysis, I can go ahead and subscribe to it. And subscribe, it means that, you know, like it will be attached to your uh, Carto account, and essentially you will be paid, you know, yearly by year if it's actually a commercial data set. So um, if it's public data, it will be free. But if it's, you know, like a commercial data set, you will get it. And that's automatically within Python Notebook. We're buying data from Python Notebook immediately when you're doing analysis. I think that's a game changer. A game changer not only because it's so fast of doing it, but now actually the notebook is explaining how you even obtain the data, which we think is really, really great. And it's a subscription. So if the data changes, you also get notified. So you can rerun your analysis. There's a lot of really nice things around it. So I'm just going to hit and boom, nice. Okay. So I'm not going to, oh, actually, um, what did I do in here? I'm going to make it work here in front of everybody. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to say uh, catalog data set dot subscribe. Ah, work. Okay. Oh, so I had it already purchased. So, um, so clearly, you know, we got a little bit of uh, but in here. But if not, I mean, like, if I wouldn't have purchased it, it will have explained, you know, in here, like, do you want to call, like, get access to this data set? It costs, in this case, $200, you know, blah, blah, all the type of things. You will accept in here, and boom, you get the data already available with it. That's great. What's the next thing that you do after you got the data? Well, the first thing is you're going to have to visualize it, right? You want to see, like, this is what I just got, got like, subscribed to. This is uh, uh, demographic information for Long Island. In this case, I'm just looking at the population. Um, we actually take the hard work if the data sets are really, really big, you know, to process them on the, on the server side so that, you know, like, they perform on something like Jupyter Python Notebook. So it's, it's a lot of, like, neat things behind the scenes. Next thing, changing geographic supports. So most analysts here, when they're like working, you know, with, uh, with location data, they find that they have to transform their data into a common structure, like a grid, hexagons, you know, like you name it, even, you know, like name some administrative boundaries. Um, so we find that that actually is a part where a lot of mistakes are done when, using, when doing analysis. And we wanted to facilitate that work by providing methods to kind of like essentially gridify your data, change, you know, like the, the scale of it. And they'll all, you know, bundle it there so that, you know, someone that is not familiar with doing that can make it easier. So that's exactly what I'm doing in here. I'm just, you know, like calling it, you know, this polyfill in quad keys. And I'm transforming my catchment areas, the isochrons that I defined before, are actual cells. What I'm going to do uh, from an analysis perspective is I'm going to say that on every cell within that catchment area around each of these polygons, I'm going to say the potential revenue for a Starbucks to be made is the same. So essentially, like, if you go, like, a Starbucks very close to another, there's no reason for them to not perform the same unless, you know, like, they happen to be together. But, you know, like, um, so it's, we're going to be using that to train our model with more data than just the points that I have itself. So this is just one idea in there, right? Next thing, now that I have my data that I just got, you know, from demographics, spatial data enrichment. So in this case, what I'm looking at, you know, like, it's, what are the variables that, I'm, that I just got, you know, from this data set that I looked at before? And what I'm doing with this method, enrichment, essentially is telling, like, get my data frame and augment it with all the variables that, you know, like, from that other data set. I'm doing it here, you know, by using um, a point scale like intersection. But we also support enrichment through polygons where you actually call, like, do all the, all the hard work of, of, you know, like, matching them and so on. So that's very, very cool. So now what do I get? For every kind of like uh, um, for every cell of a study, I do actually get you know like the population, the average income, all these variables you know from that other data set. Right. Next, starting you know get to the to the end is the modeling. Finally, so now that I'm going towards modeling, you know I can actually uh, the first thing I'm go likely going to be doing is you know cleaning up you know looking start first at you know like the variables. What are the uh,
blackout. Oh, no, no, it's back. It's working now. Okay, good. Oh, we're good. No? Okay. They were blown away by this, right? <laughs> or it's just maybe that they thought the model was just too simple. <laughs> okay. It's going to continue. So the next thing that you got in here is, you know, like, uh, normally what you do in the model is, like, look, is there a lot of correlation between those variables? And you're selecting the ones that you want. And going very, very quickly through here, I'm only finally going to be using eight features. And here I probably have to stop and say, like, this is a very, very fast round down. We've got a lot of like data scientists here from Carto. So if you want to learn about more this particular model, you know, like they will be actually be able to show you. And actually, this is a Google Colab, so I can we we actually make public this entire URL, so you can look at it. Um, all right. So now that I've selected my variables that I'm going to be using, I finally, in this case, going to be using a generalized linear model. Nothing very sophisticated. It works in a lot of cases. A GLM. I'm using it here. You know, like it's just very, uh, very straightforward. So after Kala running all that, you know, like here's where it's going interesting, it tells me the things that you will expect. <laughs> the, far, the, the farthest that you are away from other Starbucks, the more revenue that you will make. The closer that you are, you know, like the, the less revenue that you will make. The more people that are in the area where you open the Starbucks, the more, la the more revenue that you will make. The less people, you know, like the less people, uh, the less revenue you will make. Right, so those are the, co the coefficients that you will use in there, right? So um, if we look at actually the R2 score catalog of this, you know, it's 0 0.55, not bad for a demo, but, uh, but you know, like, but that's, you know, just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of the sense of, of how you do this. Normally, after you do a model like this, one of the things that you have to look at is actually at mapping the residuals. And I like a lot this part because it mixes the discovery with the model itself. So when we are mapping the residuals, what we're looking is which places, which, yeah, which locations or which stores are actually kind of like you are under predicting or over predicting. So if I look at, you know, if I filter here, you know, like this area, you clearly see that, you know, in the area around Brooklyn, I am in Queens, I am clearly over, uh, I'm over predicting. So I'm just essentially, you know, like uh, stores will make more revenue than actually that I am predicting. Uh, that's, you know, by my test data set and so on that I've made, right? So, this already is telling me that probably my model is not taking in consideration kind of like that there's a different behavior probably in Brooklyn than there is in the rest of Long Island. So that's a great thing where we say like, ah, you probably should dig more into that area. But you know, just being able to see like this, I think you know, like it's very clear that there's like a spatial patterns on the model residuals, which I think you know, it's interesting. The last bit that I think it's very, very cool is you know, like it's model projection. Now that I have all this model done, where do I, where are the top locations really to put a Starbucks, right? After all this, where do I open a Starbucks? So this is what we call the model projection. Do the prediction for every cell of how much revenue will you produce in there. So we just go through it, and the result is this. Uh, it's just loading. This is the existing ones, and here it is. So the more yellow is, the more uh, potential revenue allocation will make. The, the, um, uh, the purple ones, you know, will be less. Obviously, opening a Starbucks very close to another Starbucks, not a very good idea. You will have less revenue. You know, the farther you are, probably the best. But also, you can see, like, things like, um, I'm actually going to call it filtering here. So if I filter, say, like, only the top, really, Starbucks that would produce more than $2 million per year, you start seeing that most of them actually happens to be in, in Brooklyn. So I'm going to be focusing uh, on Brooklyn in the last map. Just look at it. There's one that I really like it because in this model, I, I live in Long Island City. So if you know about it, it's a very, it's a, it's a very fast changing area. And one of the things that you know the model predicts is you know it's like it's opening you know like a Starbucks in Long Island City, which I, I guess it will happen very soon. So that's kind of like a little bit you know like the idea of this one. After that, I could share it and distribute it with others. I'm not going to go into it, but I hope it gives you a little bit of a, of an idea of you know like how we can actually you know go from all these steps, which are a lot, I'm not going to say that you can do a model like this in two hours. I mean, anybody that says that will be lying. But you know how we can move from you know from weeks into days, or you know, or at least make our lives less miserable. That's what we're really, in a way, you know, like looking forward, you know, with all these uh, capabilities. So we hope like you really, really uh, ex uh, uh, like them. I like you know just to finish, you know, like with a with a kind of like common um, theme that we we talk about is this. Really, it's time to stop, you know, to move from visualizing data maps to analyzing data using maps. And what I mean is, like, this concept of spatial analytics, understanding why things happen somewhere, 
is still not obvious to a lot of people. And I think, you know, like as a community, we have to come, you know, together and, you know, showcase what's, uh, why is this cool and why, what is the potential of this. So thank you very much, everybody, and look forward, you know, to meet you all in, uh, during today. And yeah, talk to you soon. All right.